reality is many Christians actually downplay prophecy and they kind of put prophecy in a different category to all the other parts of the Bible and often don't treat it with the dignity I think it deserves. Uh, John Piper, who is a well-regarded Baptist minister in America in the 21st century, this is what he actually says, and I just want to share this with you about prophecy. Uh, John Piper writes, for two generations, perhaps, we have failed to study prophecy with anything like the rigor that it deserves. We have been so afraid of being viewed as one of those Zionist, right-wing, antichrist-sniffing, culture-denying, alarmist leftovers from the Schofield Prophecy Conference era that we give hardly any energy to putting the prophetic pieces together, at least not in public. Uh, it's an interesting statement, and for me, it kind of resonates as true. A couple of weeks ago, I shared with you that the Christian church kind of has a couple of different views about end times. And one particular group takes a very literal reading of all the prophecies in the Bible. They accept the plain and literal meaning. And another group within the Christian church, they tend to think that in prophecy, numbers and places need to be interpreted allegorically or symbolically. And so you've got two different views about the end times and what's going to happen. And I'm actually really wrestling with this at the moment. I'm being brought up in one particular school and I'm wrestling with the other school and going, what is the best way to actually handle these parts of the Bible? Now, today we're looking at a passage that one of those schools of thought often uses to justify allegorical or symbolic interpretations of prophecy. Uh, let me try to explain here, okay? Let me explain what's going on. The, the, the big question is, should we interpret prophecy literally or should we interpret prophecy allegorically and symbolically? Uh, in Daniel so far, we've seen Daniel give a number of prophecies. In chapter 2 and chapter 7, he prophesied that in the fourth kingdom after Babylon, the Messiah would come. And that actually happened literally in history. In the fourth kingdom after Babylon, the Messiah came. Then in Daniel chapter 8, we got to Daniel chapter 8, and Daniel prophesied that in the future, a Greek king would destroy the temple in Jerusalem for 2,300 evening and morning sacrifices. And again, we saw that this, was, this happened literally in the days of Antiochus Epiphanes IV. The temple was destroyed, it was cut off, and the book of Maccabees tells us how it actually was fulfilled in history. But when we get to Daniel 9, one school of thought says, well, Daniel 9 isn't actually fulfilled literally in history. Its numbers don't actually add up properly. It says numbers, but those numbers don't work out. And so the time periods don't work out. And then Daniel chapter 9 kind of becomes the, the, uh, the proof text, if you like, or the precedent for not taking numbers seriously in the book of Revelation. You're following me? Uh, the big one is you get to Daniel 9 and Jeremiah prophesied that they would be 70 years in captivity of some sort and yet when we look at it and we break it down, we discover that Daniel was only in captivity for 66 or maybe 67 years and so this group of thinkers say, look, it's not a literal 70 years, it's close to 70 years, but it's not a literal 70 years, and you've got to understand that numbers are just kind of pointing in a certain direction. And then we get to the, the second half of Daniel 9, where Daniel actually prophesies that after the edict to rebuild Jerusalem, the Messiah will come 483 years later. And again, this one school of thought goes, actually, that didn't happen. Uh, the Messiah came 568 years after the edict to rebuild Jerusalem. And so again, the numbers in Daniel chapter 9 don't kind of work out literally in history. Therefore, you shouldn't take numbers too seriously in Daniel or in the book of Revelation. Now, this is a fair question. How do we actually treat the numbers, the places in the Bible, literally or symbolically. 
Uh, the, the, the camp that I grew up in and was taught said that prophecy is true in the big picture sort of stuff, but the details, well, they're not always accurate. The details are kind of allegorical and of, often symbolic. And so you take the big picture of the prophecy, but you don't look at the details. And then what happens is, because I now believe that the details are not accurate, I no longer pay attention to the details and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that they don't appear accurate. You following me? Guys, what I want to do today and over the next two weeks is just look at Daniel chapter 9 and suggest there may be plain and literal meanings for these texts that work out in history if we pay attention to the details. Now, you're going to have to judge for yourself whether I actually do this correctly. If I start manipulating the text or if I start twisting the numbers, I want you to shoot me, okay? I don't want to be one of those sort of theologians. If you, if you hear me start saying, now you've got to understand that the numbers in the Old Testament were based on lunar years and you've got to multiply it by 1.132 to come up with solar years in the Gregorian calendar, shoot me, okay? If that's what I actually do, shoot me. But if I can offer plain, sensible, how we normally handle scripture in this church, explanations of how these prophecies are fulfilled literally in history, it suddenly starts to undermine the precedent for an allegorical interpretation in the Old Testament. Now again, I don't know yet where I'm going to come down, but I'm testing the waters with you and you're going to have to judge whether I give reasonable explanations for how 70 years and 490 years are fulfilled in history. Okay, my first point today is that Jeremiah predicted Babylon would rule for 70 years. Look with me at Daniel chapter 9 verses 1 to 3. Jeremiah predicted Babylon would rule for 70 years. Reading from verse 1. In the first year of Darius son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. Now, straight away in verse 1, Daniel gives us a date. He says, in the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent. We know this is 539 BC. 539 BC, the combined kingdom of the Medes and the Persians conquered Babylon, 539 BC, and a little later in the year, 539 BC, Cyrus the Great issued a decree saying all the Jews could go back to Jerusalem, okay? 539 BC. But we know from the book of Daniel that Daniel was among the first slaves who went to Babylon in 605 BC. Uh, Daniel chapter 1. So you do the math, 605 BC, he's the first of the slaves who go to Babylon and we get to 539 BC. You've got 66 years or at a stretch maybe 67 years if you go for the end of both those years. But you don't have 70 years. And herein lies the problem. The suggestion is Jeremiah is not quite accurate. Now, we know from other historical records, okay, so Babylonian history, that when Babylon was conquered, it does seem to be Darius the Mede who oversaw the conquest of Babylon city. So Darius the Mede came in, conquered Babylon June 539 BC. Meanwhile, his partner in crime, Cyrus the Great, was off fighting another battle, and he doesn't actually turn up in Babylon till October. 539 BC. So we're still in 539 BC and Daniel's probably speaking between these two events. He refers to Darius, he doesn't refer to Cyrus, so maybe Cyrus hasn't yet arrived. But Daniel discerns that in the conquest of Babylon, somehow prophecy in Jeremiah is being fulfilled. You notice that? It's just happened, Darius the Mede has conquered the place and he goes, hang on, this rings a bell with Jeremiah. 70 years, said Jeremiah, about and so he goes back to look at Jeremiah. Now, if I was to ask the average Christian sitting here in church today, what was the content of Jeremiah's prophecy about 70 years? 
What did Jeremiah actually prophesy about 70 years? I think most Christians who have been Christians for a while will say to me, well, Jeremiah prophesied that the Jews would be slaves in Babylon for 70 years. But did Jeremiah actually predict that? We've kind of possibly overlooked the details. What did Jeremiah actually prophesy? If he prophesied 70 years of slavery in Babylon, and then there was only 66 years of slavery in Babylon, maybe we've got a problem. But what did Jeremiah actually prophesy in 605 BC? Well, going back, let's have a look. This is the first prophecy from Jeremiah 25, and I'm reading from verse 8. Look at what he says. Is there any hint of slavery in this passage? It says 25 verse 8. Therefore the Lord Almighty says this, because you have not listened to my words, I will summon all the peoples of the north and my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, declares the Lord, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all the surrounding nations. I will completely destroy them and make them an object of horror and scorn and an everlasting ruin. I will banish from them the sounds of joy and gladness, the voices of bride and bridegroom, the sound of millstones, and the light of the lamp. The whole country, literally Israel and the surrounding nations, uh, will become a desolate wasteland, and these nations, Israel and the others, will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation, the land of Babylonians, for their guilt, declares the Lord, and will make it desolate forever. Does it actually say there that they will be slaves in Babylon for 70 years? It doesn't, does it? Yet for many, many years, scholars have been saying, Jeremiah says they're going to be in slavery for 70 years. But does that actually say it? Not that I can see. It just says that Israel and the surrounding nations will actually be subservient to the kingdom of Babylon for a period of 70 years. That's what it says. Now, surely the other prophecy in, in Jeremiah must say that they will be slaves for 70 years because we've got this from somewhere. Let's have a look at Jeremiah 29. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. Again, does it clearly say that they will be in slavery 70 years? It doesn't clearly say that. Now, the King James Version of the Bible, if you've got the King James Version of the Bible, tries to make it say that. It says that after 70 years have com been completed in Babylon, but the actual Hebrew does not use the word in anywhere. And NASB, ESV, Holman will all show you that it's just saying when 70 years are completed for Babylon, then God will bring them back. The object of the 70 years is Babylon. Now, friends, this raises a really different question on Jeremiah's prophecy. Did Jeremiah actually predict that they would be slaves in Babylon for 70 years, or did he predict that Babylon would be the world's superpower for 70 years? The plain meaning of the text, the plain and most literal meaning of the Hebrew and the, the translations is that Babylon will be the world's superpower for 70 years. Now the question is, <coughs> was Babylon the world's superpower for 70 years? And the answer is yes, exactly 70 years. You, look, you talk to any historian, any scholar, and you say, when did Babylon become the world's superpower? And they say in 609 BC, when they conquered Assyria in the city of Haran. Everyone knows this. Babylon defeated Assyria in the city of Haran in 609 BC, and then they became world superpower. What year did Persia and the Medes conquer them? 539 BC, which we just looked at. How many years is that? 70 years. All of a sudden, we have a literal fulfillment of Jeremiah that I think is credible and plausible. Now, have I manipulated the text at all? Have I played any games with the text? No, I've just said, look, let's look at what Jeremiah says. Let's see if that actually happened in history. And I've given you 70 years Babylon was actually the superpower of the world, and Jeremiah seems to have a literal fulfillment. Now, guys, I do this because I'm... I believe that when it comes to most parts of the Bible, the plain and literal meaning of the text is the way we should read it. I always believe the best way to read the Bible is to accept the plain and literal meaning of the text. 
except we don't do that when we come to prophecy and things in the book of Revelation. So in 2 Thessalonians, we're told to expect a man of lawlessness in this world at some point who is going to deceive the church. I think that might actually happen in history. In Revelation 11, we're told that there are going to be two witnesses at some point who bear witness to Jesus in Jerusalem before they are put to death by the nations of the world. Is that actually going to happen or is that only symbolic? We get to Revelation 13 and we're all told to watch out for the mark of the beast which is necessary for buying and selling. Now, is that a literal mark or is it just something we sort of go, well, it's probably... You know, I ask Christians, I say to Christians, I hear Christians say to me, I know the Bible says 70 years, but it didn't really mean 70 years. And I know the Bible talks about a mark of the beast, but I don't think it means a literal mark of the beast. And so I then say to those Christians, so what do you think the mark means? And they go, well, I don't know. <laughs> Is that sufficient? Or should you just accept what the plain and literal meaning of the Bible says on this particular subject? Guys, I'm wrestling here. I'm truly wrestling. And what I'm wanting to say is until we have a good precedent from the Old Testament for not taking the plain and literal meaning of prophecy, I think we should stick with the plain and literal meaning of prophecy. And Daniel 9, Jeremiah 70 years, we've just found a literal fulfillment of the 70 years. But in case you're dubious about the 70 years I've just given you, Daniel gives us another literal option as well. You're dubious about my 70 years, Daniel will give you another 70 years that is literally fulfilled, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. Now, this is a different 70 years as well. This is not 70 years in slavery. This is not 70 years for the Babylonian kingdom. Daniel's actually saying, I understood as an inspired prophet from God that the 70 years is referring to the length of time that Jerusalem will be made desolate. 70 years is referring to that. Now, I'm not going to argue with Daniel as an inspired prophet, but he's saying the 70 years in Jeremiah are actually referring to the desolation of the temple. Um, as Daniel digs deep into Jeremiah's prophecy, so Daniel's getting into Jeremiah's prophecy, he starts to see something deeper in it than what we just looked at. I just gave you the plain text on the page, this is what it actually says, and we went, okay, that seems to be talking about Babylonian kingdom. But Daniel gets into it and he starts wrestling, and as he looks at the book of Daniel, uh, the book of Jeremiah, he sees that God's judgment and God's desolation actually comes around the temple in Jerusalem. The real judgment of God is that the temple is destroyed and people no longer have access to God in the temple. And so he starts to see that actually the 70 years, the desolation of God may actually have to do with the time the temple is destroyed. Uh, for those of you who were with us last week, remember in Daniel chapter 8, we heard about a rebellion that would bring desolation to the temple for 2,300 morning and evening sacrifices. Now we're in Daniel chapter 9, and he's saying the desolation is coming to the temple for 70 actual years is what he discerns from the book of Jeremiah. Now, is this a reasonable interpretation? If you went back and you really studied the book of Jeremiah and accepted the plain and literal meaning of Jer Jeremiah and got into it deep, would you actually arrive at the same conclusion as Daniel? I think you would. You see, when you get into the book of Jeremiah and you really wrestle with it, God makes it clear that is what is happening to the Jewish temple is what happened to Shiloh in the days of 1 Samuel. Let me just show you what Jeremiah actually says about the temple and what's going to happen. This is from Jeremiah chapter 7, but it gets repeated in Jeremiah 26 right after the 70-year prophecy, okay? So... Jeremiah 7, go now to the place in Shiloh where I first made a dwelling for my name and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. While you were doing all these things, declares the Lord, I spoke to you again and again, but you did not listen. I called you, but you did not answer. Therefore, what I did to Shiloh, I will now do that to the house that bears my name, the temple you trust in, the place I gave to you and your fathers." Uh, what, what Jeremiah is saying is history is going to repeat itself. 
We've already seen this in Daniel. History repeats itself. But Jeremiah is now saying history is going to repeat itself. Now, some of you are going, I can see blank looks on your faces. You're going, what's Shiloh all about? Shiloh was the place the Jews first set up the tabernacle when they entered into the promised land. So before there was a temple built by King Solomon, Moses built a tabernacle, a giant tent-like church. And when they entered the promised land, they set the tabernacle up in Shiloh. But all the Jews started being rebellious to God in the days of 1 Samuel and Eli. They didn't obey God. And so God sent the Philistines to destroy the tabernacle. And then they took the Ark of the Covenant, they carried it down the street, and they put it into a Philistine temple of Dagon. And if you remember, Dagon keeps falling down and breaking his nose in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant. Do you remember the story? You can read it in 1 Samuel 4 to chapter 6 if you want to. But Jeremiah is saying, history is going to repeat itself again. Just as it happened back then with the tabernacle, so it's going to happen again in the days of the temple. And Daniel gets to the end of his prayer. Look at verse 17. Look at what he actually prays in verse 17. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant. For your sake, O Lord, look with favour on your desolate sanctuary. What does he believe is going to be desolate in Jerusalem for 70 years? The sanctuary. Now we've got another question altogether. It's not were the Jews in slavery for 70 years. It's was the temple actually destroyed for a total length of time of 70 years? You might want to argue with Daniel and say he's misinterpreting Jeremiah. You, might, you, can, you can argue with me and say I'm misinterpreting Jeremiah, but I don't know if you really want to argue with Daniel as an inspired prophet and say he's misinterpreting scripture. So the question is, was the Jewish temple destroyed for a total period of time of 70 years? Yes, exactly 70 years. Uh, we've given two dates. Jeremiah 52, if you've got the sermon outline, it's in Jeremiah 52. Uh, we're actually told that it was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar that the Jewish temple was destroyed. That's 586 BC. 586 BC, the temple is destroyed. Then we come to the book of Ezra, Ezra chapter 6, and we're told the temple is rebuilt and reopened in the sixth year of Darius, which happens to be 516 BC. So 586 BC minus 516 BC is how many years? 70 years. So all of a sudden, despite what you may have actually heard, the plain reading of Jeremiah and the plain reading of Daniel chapter 9, we've suddenly got not one 70 years, we've got two 70 years that are totally literal and totally plausible according to the text. Now, have I manipulated numbers? Have I actually done anything here that's kind of underhanded or... I'm just showing you that there is a literal interpretation for the 70 years that is bang on 70 years, not once but twice. And if it is literal, where is the precedent for taking non-literal readings of the numbers in prophecy? You know what? My third point today is that Daniel had a high view of Scripture and this means he responds to God aright. Daniel has a very high view of Scripture and responds to God aright. Look with me at chapter 9, verse 2. Chapter 9, verse 2, it says, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the Scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from the commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name, to our kings, our princes and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. You know, I could have spent the whole sermon today just looking at this amazing prayer in Daniel chapter 9. It's an amazing prayer, and we could have got a lot just out of the prayer. But I wanted to look at why Daniel prays in the way he does, and it's because Daniel has the highest regard for the Word of God. It's the Word of God that actually informs his prayer in the way he prays. 
I want you to break down with me in verse 2. Look at what it says in verse 2. I, Daniel, understood from the Scriptures. What's he talking about? I, Daniel, understood from the Scriptures. He's talking about the Old Testament. What Daniel is saying is, in my worldview, there is a book in this world that's unlike any other book in this world. There is a book in this world that comes directly from God. It is spoken by God, so it is sacred to me because it contains the Word of God. And I take it entirely seriously. Now, does your worldview have a, a view of the Scriptures being the Word of God? Not just sort of the Word of God, but the very words of God. Of God. Daniel hits a rough patch. Uh, Babylon's just been conquered by Persia. His world's getting turned upside down. He goes, I'm going to turn to God's word and see if God's word's got anything to say about my future or what is going on around me. And as he gets into the Bible, what does he discover? God does actually have answers for what is happening around him and to Babylon. And God clearly says, What's happened to you is because of the sinfulness of your people. The reason the temple has been destroyed is because of the sinfulness of your people. The reason how long it will be destroyed is 70 years because of the sinfulness of your people. Now, when God says that Babylon conquered Jerusalem because of the sinfulness of God's people, Daniel doesn't question that and go, ah, oh, no, I just think it's world politics. <laughs> no, he accepts what God says. It was because of the sinfulness of God's people. And when God says it's going to be destroyed for 70 years, Daniel goes, no, I don't think it's a metaphorical 70 years. I don't think it's a symbol. I think it's a literal 70 years and God will keep his promise and rebuild the temple at the right time. And so Daniel falls on his knees and trusting in God's word, responds to God's word based on what it actually says. Look with me at the next bit of verse 2. Verse, the next bit of verse 2 says, from the scriptures according to the word of the Lord given to the Jeremiah the prophet. Who is the ultimate author of scripture? Jeremiah didn't just get lucky and go, ah, oh, I think they're going to be 70 years of destruction for the temple. Lucky yes. Daniel doesn't come into his book and go, ah, oh, I think the Messiah will come in the fourth kingdom after Babylon. No, God gives him these details, just as he gives us details about how he wants to live and history, accurately and truthfully. Why would God give us details that are close but not quite right? Why would he say this many years when it was actually this many years? It, it kind of doesn't really make sense. You've got to totally change your doctrine of Scripture. So believing the plain and literal meaning of Scripture, Daniel goes, the only right and proper thing for me to do is fall on my knees and cry out to God for mercy and forgiveness. Based on what God's word says, that is the only right response. Friends, if you truly engage with God's word and just accept the plain and literal meaning of the words on the page in the Bible, its overwhelming message will be, we are all sinners who have fallen under the judgment and condemnation of God. If you just read the plain meaning of scripture, work through, the, the overwhelming message is that we are all sinful. We have fallen under the judgment of God and we deserve to be punished. Now, at this very point, Daniel's like, Lord, is this the end of our punishment? We know we've sinned against you, but are we going to be restored at this point? Is 70 years under Babylonian rule enough to pay for our sins? Is the destruction of the temple enough to actually pay for our sins? Can I actually come back into your presence now and be fully restored in my relationship with you? And God's going to finish this prayer by sending the angel Gabriel to say, actually, no, um, 70 years under Babylonian rule is not enough to pay for your sins. And the destruction of the temple is not enough to pay for your sins. Uh, 483 years past the edict to rebuild Jerusalem, a Messiah will come. And he will be cut off halfway through the seventh, the last seven. Guys, the overwhelming message of the Bible that we are sinners. We have fallen under the judgment of God just like them. 70 years isn't enough. Destruction of the temple isn't enough. What we actually needed was a perfect sacrifice. Someone, someone who was entirely like us in every way, but without sin. And then he could say, instead of punishing them, them, let me bear the punishment. 
And as Jesus died on the cross, he was taking that penalty for our sin so that we can actually be restored in our relationship with God. And because of this, because Jesus has taken the punishment for your sin, everyone here today, he has taken the punishment for your sin. If you cry out to God for mercy, if you cry out to God for forgiveness, exactly like Daniel does in this prayer, the promise of God is that you will be forgiven and you will be welcomed back into his kingdom forever and ever and ever. And that is the message of the Bible. If you take a plain and literal meaning of scripture. Now, I want to say to you, if you haven't done that, you should do that. We're a church who wants to see people accept what the Bible says, put their trust in Jesus, put their trust in God's word, and follow him as best they possibly can. If you'd like to find out more, come and talk to me. This is the gospel message, but here's the problem, okay? Everyone in this world is pulling at the edges of this gospel message and this gospel truth. It often starts with the prophetic parts, and they say, yes, it says 70 years, but it doesn't actually mean 70 years. And, and, and it says that if you, um, all sorts of things about the prophetic, but it, it says that, but it probably doesn't quite mean that. And then as you start to take a different view to one part of scripture, you then hear people saying, well, it's also true of the historical parts. The historical parts say that, but they're not actually quite accurate. You know, it says Jesus died on the cross for our sins and three days later he rose, but is that really accurate? And then once we let go of the prophetic and we start letting go of the historical, it's not long till we start letting go of the moral commands as well. And we say, yes, the Bible seems to condemn sex outside of marriage, but really it doesn't mean that, does it, anyone? Guys, I'm not wanting to actually go down a particular path when it comes to end views, but I actually love our church I love the people in our church, and I truly believe as a pastor, if I am to give you advice on how to follow God, it is read and accept the plain and literal meaning of scripture, and you will not go far wrong. Read the plain and literal meaning of scripture, and you will not go far wrong in doing that. Now, I say that knowing that next week we're looking at the second half of Daniel 9, which talks about 483 years. Whew. That's going to get interesting, isn't it? But here's the question. Did today, did we find a plain and literal fulfillment of 70 years that seems to make sense of Jeremiah and Daniel chapter 9? I think in faith, we'd have to say, yes, there is a 70 literal years that seems to align with the prophecies. So with that in mind, all I ask of you is next week, Remember where we finished up this week. We actually finished up with the completion of the temple in 516 BC, Ezra chapter 6. And next week, we're going to take up the latter part of Daniel 9, starting with Ezra 7. We finished with Ezra 6, the rebuilding of the temple. We're going to take up the latter part of Daniel 9 from Ezra 7, when they start rebuilding Jerusalem proper. Let me pray and let me encourage you to continue with the plain and literal meaning of scripture. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we love you and we are absolutely amazed at your ability to not just foretell the future, but to guide us in life and tell us how to live and to keep us on the narrow path that Jesus laid out for us. Lord, we know that to do that well and to do that faithfully, we must listen to you and we must sit under your word and let you plainly and clearly speak to us, not questioning what you say, but accepting what it says wherever that is appropriate. Lord, I pray and ask that as we continue through Daniel, that we will stand in awe and reverence of you. And Lord, that our understanding of Daniel may help inform our understanding of Revelation as well. Lord, I pray and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.